State legislators are working on a bill to make changes in police use of force, accountability for misconduct, and the practice of racial profiling. Just before the bill was approved in the state Senate, there was a rally in its support organized by a group of faith leaders. Joining us is one of those leaders, the associate pastor at 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury, Reverend Willie Bodrick II. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Reverend. Thank you, Chris, for having me, and I truly appreciate you taking time today to talk. Reverend, I'm sure you've heard the term over and over again in all of the protest march activity has been happening over the past month and a half, and that is the call for systemic change. Do you see this legislation producing that? Well, I think it's a start to that systemic change. Uh, we've been in an interesting moment, and, uh, and I would argue that we've been in an interesting period. Um, what we saw with George Floyd, uh, with the knee on his neck from a state actor, a police officer publicly lynching, in my opinion, an African-American black man, uh, father, friend, a cousin to someone. Uh, it was such a devastating moment for this country. And I think we're particularly at a turning point. Um, you know, you think about Breonna Taylor, uh, you think about uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, uh, who's from my hometown. Uh, you, you think critically about where we are in this nation, and, and it's forced us to reevaluate not just particularly policing, which I think needs to do that, we need to do that, but also all of our systems that have disproportionate effects on people of color, particularly Black people in our country, and particularly in our state. And I think um, people have been marching to the streets. You know, I've been, been on, at protest after protest, marching with community persons, with advocates, um, sharing in conversations about you know, how do we take our protests to actually become policy. And so I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, I think there are some things that come into this bill, things like banning tactics uh, and practices like chokeholds, um, um, the big conversation around limiting qualified immunity, um, establishing new ways to hold police officers accountable uh, in a time where we have more visibility to the realities of what's happening on the streets. And so I think this is the step in the right direction. And I'm hoping um, that now that uh, we've passed it through the Senate, um, that we're able to take it to the House and then hopefully uh, get it to the governor's desk before July 31st. On the surface, what happened to George Floyd was an event in another state, in another part of the country, but this resonated deeply with people here. Why, why was that the case? Well, well, Chris, you have to think about this, uh, both historically and, and recognize that people have personal experiences with law enforcement um, that are not always good. Um, you know, law enforcement have been called to, to serve and protect, but in many ways, people have felt uh, terrorized in many instances, but also just fearful, constant anxiety um, by the fact that there have been misconduct, there has been behavior um, that ha has not been comely by many, you know, many of officers in many times. Um, that's not to suggest that, that, that the job that many officers do is not difficult, but it is to recognize that, that many of times when these things happen, people feel that accountability is not there. And when things happen to people in our community, uh, when bad actors act badly, they are held accountable. And so um, when you think about this from a historical perspective, you know, we think deeply about the, the, the connections that we have, particularly as black people in this nation, of state actors, uh, particularly acting in manner that has both uh, abused, uh, that has both uh, hurt as well as killed black bodies. You know, in, in our, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and, and, and many of black families, there have been many of whispers and rumors of, you know, they said this happened, but we're sure that, that this is what actually happened. And I think what we've been beneficiaries of in this particular time is that we have social media. Um, we've moved slowly, but not as fast as I think we should towards police cameras. And we've been able to capture narratives that actually push back on police reports that may not be consistent with what has happened at all. Um, you, you think about all the things that have happened since we, we look at you know, moments like Michael Brown. I was actually in Ferguson um, marching in that particular time. And you look at what happened to Eric Gardner. Um, you look at you know, what happened to uh, Brother Sterling down in Louisiana. You look at what's happened across the board, and name after name. Um, you, know, you think about these particular instances, Sandra Bland. And we've been able to capture what has happened. And so I think what, what, what pushed us, um, and not only here in Massachusetts, but there is a, a, a interconnectedness of these narratives that we must acknowledge and we must recognize that there's work for us to do here in Boston, but also here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, as it relates to police misconduct as well.
One uh, systemic problem we've heard about in a lot of uh, locations is that, that much of the problems with the police misconduct comes from a small percentage of officers. Uh, how do you see this legislation dealing with that? Well, you know, I think one of the things that we, we need to see is that there is more accountability and there's data collection. Um, we, we, we usually hear the, the continual trope that, you know, there's a few bad apples, but I don't think we're doing the proper data collection in order to do that. I know there's going to be set forward um, a conversation around uh, establishing a police officer standards and accreditation committee, um, and that is within this bill. Um, to make sure that we are thinking critically about how do we monitor and invest, investigate uh, uh, police misconduct. And I think that is a huge part of capturing uh, the narrative of whether it's just a few bad apples or it is actually a way more pervasive problem than we, that we have yet to address. I also believe that uh, in many ways that you know Massachusetts is one of six states that does not have a means to uh, uh, both uh, license as well as uh, a means to revoke the license of an officer. And I think that is another part of this conversation that we're not allowing for officers that have behaved in misconduct, that have behaved in uh, police brutality, continue to operate. But we can't do that if we're not capturing the information, if we're not looking in and doing the oversight and ensuring that we will be doing the work to monitor the behaviors and action of those who our tax dollars pay to make sure that they're doing their job. Well, I'm sure, as you're aware, uh, there's resistance to changes in qualified in immunity for police officers from police unions and also from Manlio, which represents officers of color. Uh, uh, what's your response to that? Well, first and foremost, um, you know, I've, I've worked very closely with uh, many of the brothers and sisters in Manlio. Uh, we, you know, my church, we, we've been doing peace walks in the community for years. Um, uh, we've been working closely with um, both local law enforcement, and we have good relationships with particularly officers of color in the city. Um, I think the first thing is that we have to understand what qualified immunity is, right? Uh, qualified immunity is a protection that was created through legal precedents by the Supreme Court. And it has, in my opinion, has been continually expanded by the court. And what I think people are particularly talking about is not that we're removing it completely, even though, in my opinion, I think that's the direction we should be going. But I do believe that we're talking about narrowing the scope narrowing the scope of qualified immunity so that egregious acts are not passed by because of this particular protection. And for far too long, qualified immunity has shielded and protected officers um, from accountability. Um, it's, it's protected those who are many a times who participate in excessive force, who are many a times participate in police brutality, who have continued to do things uh, and uh, commit acts and perpetuate behavior that should not be perpetuated, particularly in those in communities um, that, that have, you know, uh, that our people are work, living, working and living in and doing the work they do daily. And so I think what we need to understand, and I hope the officers are coming to the table in good faith to understand, is that there are bad actors and those actors should be accountable. And I think even police officers should agree with me on that, 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 that the bad actors that are in their police forces that are in their departments should not continue to be police officers. And that forces us to have another conversation around uh, what many would call the blue wall of silence uh, and the protections that we have given our police officers um, who have to do a difficult job, but we must hold those accountable who are not upholding the standards of serving and protecting. And I think we need to uphold the, the reality that no one is above the law, not even those officers who are are working in our police forces. No one is above the law, and we need to have mechanisms in place to hold those officers accountable. And so that's really what qualified immunity should be focused on. Um, I, I think the bill is a step. Um, it's a first step. Um, my, my goal in seeing this bill is that we actually get to a place where we are holding officers accountable. But I think the legislature recognizing that they've been doing this work, um, I think this, this actually this portion of qualified immunity bill went through the ju judiciary committee and was easily passed through in, in February. And so it's, it's, it's ironic to me that all of a sudden we're having a different conversation, we're getting this pushback um, because initially this was, this was an easy go. And so, and, and I'm okay with having a conversation, but I do think that in this particular moment, acknowledging what has happened. All you have to do is open up your Facebook page, open up your Twitter account, 
open up your Instagram account and you will see countless, countless, countless narratives of officers' misconduct. And I think we as Massachusetts should follow Colorado and be the second state to actually move quickly on this and do something about it. Uh, a little bit of comment about police in schools. Uh, what would you like to see changed? Well, I think, you know, we know that there is what, what many would have captured as the, the school to prison pipeline. I, I, we usually talk about it as a cradle to prison pipeline. And in many of communities, particularly those like mine who have uh, multiple and, and over uh, engagement with law enforcement, uh, we, we want to see that our children don't get, uh, you know, shoved into this pipeline and continue towards a path that would not allow them to both be restored as well as redeemed in these systems. Uh, we know that many of children for, for very small, small things have been both in, interacted and engaged with law enforcement unnecessarily. And so I think there are ways that we can think critically about what does it mean to have school policing, right? What does that even look like? And I think uh, issues of disciplinary infractions, especially, particularly if they're not um, issues that are going to bring harm to the uh, other students and to staff in the school system, um, those issues should be figured out in a way in which we can implement restorative justice practices and not policing uh, and enforcement.